we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political abuse is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, warm welcome. Welcome in the Bali. Um, my name is Tim Wagemakers. I'm program editor at the Bali and your host tonight. And I must say I'm really proud that you're all here because I saw the weather outside and it was 7.30 and I thought, okay, we'll see who manages to... Who, who was my bike? Whoa. Okay, um, I'm even more prouder that you're all here. Um, but I think you've chosen right to be here because we have um, a special guest tonight. Uh, George Ferguson, former mayor of Bristol, who also had to get through some troubles to get here because his flight got cancelled yesterday night. Um, and he waited six hours at Bristol Airport, but in the end he got a flight. So thank you, George, for putting yourself through that to uh, get here and to uh, speak here. Um, I first came across uh, George Ferguson when I saw a Tegelicht episode, which is the documentary series on Dutch television. And in 2014 there was an episode where um, they talked about the work of George in Bristol. For example, he founded the Bristol Pound. Um, he made sure that uh, Bristol was the European green capital of 2015. And I thought this is someone we should invite to talk about things that also matter to Amsterdam. Um, because this is actually the closure of a series called Long Live Amsterdam, or in Dutch, Leve Amsterdam, in which we have invited foreign thinkers to say something about the role cities play in the world and consequently how that affects Amsterdam. So we've had um, last month we had Saskia Sasse who talked about the financialization of our housing market. Um, the month before that we had Yevgeny Morozov, he's an internet skeptic who talked about how technology influences our lives in the city. And tonight we have uh, George Ferguson. And um, the reason we organized this series is because from January onwards, we're going to have debates with all the party leaders in Amsterdam because we have, as you probably are well aware of, municipal elections in March. But we thought it would be nice to breathe some air into those. I don't know if you have the same feeling, but sometimes the debates are a bit repetitive with the same people, the same voices, saying the same things about the same subjects. So we thought it would be nice to have some people who might have a different view upon that. And George Ferguson certainly is one of those people. Um, I looked some things up about you because you are an architect and uh, George Ferguson um, made the tobacco factory. Um, um, he made it into some cultural place in Bristol. He was elected mayor in um, uh, Bristol in uh, 2000, 2012 and he was the first elected mayor. So that was quite a unicum for Bristol, I guess. He ran as an independent. Um, in 2016, unfortunately, he didn't get re-elected, but he still travels all across the world to tell people his story about um, how cities can become more resilient and more inclusive, for example. Um, and I think that's a story that's relevant for Amsterdam as well, because we have right now the rise, rising prices of the housing market. We have terms like gentrification. And I think tonight we're going to have quite a difficult task, and I hope you will help us at the end of the night, because we're going to talk a bit about something that's abstract, but also I think everyone can feel it. It's like the character of Amsterdam. I don't know if you feel it, but in the discussions we're having, we're talking about who are we in the city and what do we want to do with this city? And I think George Ferguson is someone who poses that questions wherever he goes, so that's interesting. Um, he will be joined after his lecture by Rutger Goot Wassink, who is the political leader of the Green Left, Groen Links, in Amsterdam, and by Nadja Awaki, who also I spotted on a Tegelicht show um, this year, and she is a city maker and economist, and she's working in the Java Quartier, which is near the Java Straat, uh, a street that's, well, 
becoming more gentrified, but she has found a way to make sure that the new residents connect with the old residents and things go smooth and along as she tell you all about that. Um, but first, um, we're going to listen to George Ferguson. It's my humble job to make sure you'll be at the bar somewhere between 9.30 and 10. Um, please think about the questions you want to address because I've reserved some time for that at the end of the session. Um, and um, well, let's begin, George. It's your turn. Give him a warm welcome, George Ferguson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Am I switched on? Can you all hear me? Um, it's a great honor to be here at Dibali. I've walked past often, but it's been a mystery to me, and it's, uh, it's wonderful now to be part of it. And thank you, Tim, for asking me. Don't expect to get all the answers about what Amsterdam should do, because I'm not here to tell you what Amsterdam should do. But maybe we all learn off each other, and I think cities have so much in common. And we have, you know, listening to what Saskia was talking about, uh, from what Tim, Tim was saying, um, yeah, we are a rich city, a relatively rich city, a city of half a million with many of the same challenges uh, that come out of being expensive and therefore dividing society. And that is uh, a, a major issue, which uh, you add a few other things, uh, political things that are happening in, in the UK at the moment, is, is a challenge to any city. So, as Tim said, we were European Green Capital in 2015. Now, as an independent, directly elected mayor, and I will say right at the beginning, I'm a great advocate of directly elected mayors, and the reason I became the mayor is that I campaigned for a change in our system because I felt so strongly that our cities were being represented by people who were mainly there for political, party political reasons and representing a tiny bit of the city, and then they became... Uh, yeah, part of the biggest party in the, in the, in the council and then uh, became leader uh, indirectly rather than directly. And to me, uh, you have a very strange system, but uh, it's your business uh, where the king appoints the mayor and you get a, you know, you had a fantastic uh, mayor in, in Amsterdam. So all systems have their, um, have their benefits. Um, so Bristol is a very European city. Uh, we voted nearly two thirds to remain in Europe. We have built up such strong relations uh, with other European cities and other cities across the world. And, and to me, it was really important. And uh, so, you know, people, I encourage people to come for romantic weekends from Paris to Bristol. And, um, we're a city with a very strong environmental agenda. I mean, we are very near Glastonbury. We're a bit hippie. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've always had, really it's a great city because it, in spite of its leadership, and I said that both before and when I was leader, it's a great city because it's got people who do things. And I think any, any city that is really vibrant is there and it's, it's working because people just get off their backsides and do things in spite of what's going on uh, it, with the leadership. But the leadership can make a huge difference. It's a very green-blue city. I mean, we're fortunate. Maybe, I, I haven't made a direct comparison with Amsterdam, but you know, a third of the city is open green or blue space in terms of water and, and woodland and, and parks. And, uh, most of the city, you can walk pretty easily to a bit of green and, uh, or cycle. Um, we have hills, uh, and uh, therefore we keep fit cycling. And uh, Bristol is a place that has doubled the amount of people who cycle around the city, really important uh, to me, and um, I think it makes us, it makes us healthier. Uh, but we're way, way down below the sort of levels that uh, you expect. We are quite an anarchic city. Uh, we're the city of Banksy. Um, I came into the hotel where I'm staying and there was a Banksy on the wall, so that made me feel at home. Um, and we, we have the biggest uh, street art festival in, in, in Europe. Um, because I know Amsterdam have the biggest and the best of a lot of things, but we have the biggest street art festival in Europe around the tobacco factory. Uh, and, um, you know, we have a, a, we're always putting our tongues in our cheeks about every, every issue uh, there that was Banksy at work. Where I come from is that 
I went to architectural school in Bristol. That's why I'm there. I was one of those students who stuck there. It's one of those cities where you do. And um, the first book I read in architectural school was not about Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright and B. Sandero, although I did. The first book I, I picked up at the architectural school library was a book that had been published two, two years earlier, Jane Jacobs' The Death and Life of the Great American City. And you know, that grasped me. It made me realize that as an architect, you're not there just to build buildings for the magazines, because I think a lot of architects think they are. And here was Jane Jacobs, who was somebody who tackled the most powerful planner in the world, city planner in the world, and made changes in her own city because of her kids, her family, her neighbors, and realizing that uh, it was all being compromised for highway planning. And um, so Jane Jacobs was one of my heroes. Another was Aldo van Eyck. And one of my projects at architectural school, which was a crafty project because I decided I would compare Amsterdam, Copenhagen and Zurich as playable cities uh, with Bristol. And uh, Aldo van Eyck was somebody who had built the first playground in Amsterdam in 1947, the year I was born. And he built a, a, eventually 700. He created in one way or another 700 playgrounds across Amsterdam. Very few of them remain. They were on old building sites and what have you. Some of you will know of him. But he was an architect. He was a hero. He was a people person. And uh, I think that my other architect hero is somebody uh, called Jan Gale in Copenhagen, who I also came across as a result of this project that I did in 1969. And as a result of that project, I got involved uh, in, uh, so this was a, a, a typical, very simple intervention in the city that, that brought something from being a derelict site into something that, uh, that, that uh, animated uh, children. And so I went back to Bristol and I, I, I got involved in the adventure play movement and we built adventure playgrounds in a very rough and ready way before uh, health and safety was uh, thought about too much. And they were a little bit dangerous, but I don't remember killing anybody. And actually most of the children uh, came out a lot better than they would have done if they'd been on the streets. And so um, I think sometimes we, we are too careful. We are you know, too precise about the things we do. And I think we need to be a bit rough and ready about, about what we do in the city. Now, how can I come and tell Amsterdam how to be a better city? It's a beautiful place. I love it. Uh, my most recent intervention with Amsterdam was when we came to set up uh, the Global Parliament of Mayors, uh, which uh, we did, and uh, which uh, this, this was the inaugural meeting, and um, I was asked by, by Ben Barber, who invented this whole idea to, to uh, moderate this meeting, and uh, we had Everhart uh, van der Leen there, and he was absolutely tremendous, and Ahmed Abu Talib, and uh, now the Global Parliament of Mayors, incidentally, is going to have uh, its next session in Bristol uh, next, uh, in October. Um, but the whole point of the Global Parliament of Mayors is that cities learn from each other, yes, but cities probably have more to contribute to national and international issues um, than many national governments because we're so much closer to the issues, those social issues, those difficult issues about uh, affordability, about uh, marginalization of po populations and, and particularly of the poor, and the interdependence uh, of uh, people both within the city and, and cities with the, with the countryside and everything else. And this was a talk that was spun off from the Global Parliament of Mayors session that we had. But I'm going to talk about the thing that ties together what I'm going to talk about is city resilience. We'd just been selected as European Green Capital. And I thought, yes, but we need to do something that, is, that really ties this together. We're not going to be able to stop global warming on our own. But what we are going to be able to do is plan for whatever happens. And resilience, I, uh, I think of as both a physical and a social thing. And so I heard about. Yeah, you know, this is yeah, city resilience. There, you can read it. I don't. I'm not going to read stuff out, because uh, PowerPoints 
are really boring when you do that. But, um, but resilience is a way, I think, of bringing everything together in a city about what sort of city do you want in 50 years' time? And uh, so we started this 50 years resilience strategy with uh, the um, uh, with the 100 resilient cities, and uh, because we had heard that uh, that they were looking for cities to come together to learn from each other, and uh, I, apply, I applied and. Uh, uh, when I have a cu had a cup of coffee with the new director, and uh, we became one of the 100 resilient cities. And I think that that has driven a lot of what we've done. But I'm not going to be talking a lot of technical stuff, but I, just because you'll ask for your money back if you don't get some of it, um, I will just show you the sort of thinking we went through in terms of uh, creating a resilient city uh, on these four planks of people, knowledge, place, and organization. Um, dealing with health, identity, finance, uh, protection, you know, flooding, and all those things that uh, uh, any coastal city has to deal with, as well as uh, one that has got change of leadership. Uh, you know, cities. Our, our democratic system is the is the least worst system, but it's uh, one that is not a is not very resilient, and we get big swings sometimes. So how we create a more stable form of governance for our cities, I think, is a, a, a very important thing as well. Um, aging infrastructure. A lot of our cities are getting the. The people are getting older, there are less young people to support them, and all those things, racial inequalities, uh, obviously social inequalities, uh, health inequalities. Um, Bristol, for instance, I don't know what the figures are in Amsterdam, has a nine-year life expectancy differential depending on your postcode, depending where you live. More importantly, it has a 15-year health, healthy life differential. So we tend to measure, politicians love measuring things by fact. And it's a fact when people are born and when they die. What is more subjective is what is good health. And health has become a major political football. The National Health Service is a big political football. But we only talk about the amount of money that goes into the National Health Service. We, it's, an Ill, it's an illness service, and we're not talking about how we keep people healthy. And I think the cities are the best places for keeping people healthy. And uh, the best place to start is with the young. So Bristol has moved from being an industrial, dirty city, and to a certain extent, to being a very clean, creative city with, uh, make, with uh, creative industries, uh, of which most, one of the most visible ones, I suppose, is making hot air balloons. And this is a health warning about my talk, is that all my ideas are recycled. They're recycled from some of my heroes that I talked about earlier on. And some of the best things are recycled. I believe that we should make the most of what we've got. So look at our cities. What have we got? Where do we go from here, rather than trying to be somewhere else, which uh, is always a mistake. So. Imperial tobacco, one of the big industries. We specialized in Bristol in the killing industries. We, uh, you know, um, tobacco, defense, slavery, chocolate. And um, so the city had many of these buildings in it. And uh, this is a personal project just to show you the way I think and work. And uh, all these buildings were being demolished, and I thought that was criminal. And so uh, I managed to, and this is uh, making cigarettes in this building. It's, uh, it now looks, you know, that, that's what it looked like. Uh, you know, not great architecture, but great bit of city. Abandoned in the 80s, actually, and uh, in the early 80s. And I bought one of the buildings for peanuts for very little money. Um, what you can't, you, you know, as I bought 5,000 square meters for what you could now buy a terrace house for. And uh, I thought, what the hell do I do with this? I will put some cultural content into it, and I put a theater into it. And uh, now it's, uh, it, it is a creative hub. And 
what's much more important, it's not about the building, it's about what spills out from the building. So around that area, there were shops failing and uh, a high street, I'm here standing in the high street taking that photograph, and the high street was failing. It's now a really thriving high street. And I get the gentrification thing thrown at me occasionally, but it's a very socially diverse area. It used to be all white, it's now much more mixed because south of the river was all white and there was one black guy and uh, I saw him last week and asked him what it was like now being lost in the face of other black guys he said he thought he said he really missed being just the one black guy you know uh, we we set up the tobacco factory as a as a campaign for independence powered by the you know the sun that we get every day and um, and it's now, uh, we got one theatre in it, we now, uh, we're building a second theatre in it because I started another theatre down the road, and, uh, but I was uh, in my brewery that I later started, and uh, now we need the space for the brewery, so we're building a second theatre within the tobacco factory, which is, puts on local and international uh, shows, and um, I've turned the theatre, it was just a, it's a factory space with lights in it. And you wouldn't design a theatre like that, and yet it's one of the best theatres you can feel because somehow it, it just, it's very intimate. It's 300 people in the round, generally. Um, we encourage, uh, we, we involve children, so we get them involved with the theatre and dance. Uh, health and fitness, sorry, I'm just going to quickly push through. We've got a lot of creative industries. Uh, Food is a vitally important factor, I think, in any community. Uh, food and drink. Uh, we, there, there is the campaign uh, that uh, I started with 20 years ago, Strike a Light for Independence, um, competing with a friend of mine in Manchester who was doing the same thing. Um, I think we are losing the soul of our cities because the chains are, are taking over, and we need to break those chains. And I think this is a really, really serious issue. It is the big issue. It is the big economic issue. That we won't get that economics of happiness that I like to talk about uh, if we only pursue GDP with big corporations, escaping tax, uh, employing less people, and that we'll get so much better if we've got small, local, um, organize it. And it's, it's not either or, it's about getting the right balance. Um, the small independents are employing typically twice as many people per pound as the, as, as the big corporations. In Bristol we get quite serious about this. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, you know, we have to, and, and we, have, we have living over the top of it, we use the car park at weekends for markets, Sorry, I, something's gone wrong with my presentation. All that was bold white out of, out of the, so you could read it, but anyway. Um, from, so uh, we now spread the market into the street. Uh, I, I took over an old garage and an old brewery tower, and we started a brewery and a bakery down the street because we wanted our own beer and our own bread in our own cafe. That now serves a wider community. The bread is delivered by bike, the beer can't be because it's too heavy, um, and uh, it's, it's about doing good with business. I think there's, there's a tendency to think that business is about making money in order to do good. Actually, to me, it's really important that we do good with business, and that's a fundamental thing in terms of good economics of a city. Um, so. Uh, using bowl grab. Anyway, I went from doing all that sort of stuff into being crazy enough to say in 2011 that we should have a directly elected mayor because the, uh, the government was giving us the opportunity to do that and uh, that uh, I believed that it should be an independent. And then people started saying, well, okay, you said it, do it. So. I stood as an independent. It's really difficult in the UK to stand as an independent for anything because we're very party politicized and uh, you can probably only do it once, which I've probably proved. And um, uh, because the, you know, I had, there were 70 party councillors 
uh, and the what brought the four parties together was the uh, was being able to try and uh, compete with or do down the mayor. So it was tough. Although I did have some allies on the council, and I brought, I had a cabinet of five, which was me plus one from each of the political parties on the council. And I said, you bring your party politics into the room and you're out. And they didn't, and they, we get on brilliantly, and we're good friends, and uh, we drove the city in a totally different way. And they, in effect, became independents. And I think that's really important. It's not about not accepting parties, but it's about people being able to think primarily in their interests, their city, and not allow their party to pull the strings, because that is what seems to and then to give people permission to dream about what their city can be like and involve them in it. And this you may recognize uh, as a photograph I took in, in Amsterdam and to answer the question of who owns the city because it certainly doesn't belong to the mayor and it certainly doesn't belong to the, the council um, uh, who sometimes I think think they own the city uh, and doesn't belong to the business. So one of the things we've done over the last 10 years is form a uh, what we call the Green Capital Partnership. In fact, it was started before Europe started the Green Capital um, formally uh, because we had this. We thought this is something we can aim for, and it brought lots of lots of people together. Um, and what I felt was really important is that we engaged all communities and we set up what we call the Green and Black. Uh, the Green and Black um, campaign, and they run that on a radio station called Ujima in Bristol. And so because it was, you know, I think a lot of these environmental issues are very white. Um, we had what I've called population challenges. In many ways, I think they're great, uh, they're great assets. 45 religions, 90 languages, 184, 187 countries of birth. Um, so we're quite a diverse city, um, and, uh, and uh, we decided we'd celebrate this with 91 ways, different ways of cooking. And that pro this project, which we funded out of Green Capital, is now persisting and um, is just a wonderful way of getting people together. Um, so um, if you thought this was an architectural lecture, it is much more about those sort of things about celebrating our differences. I'm not going to read that or even leave it long enough for you to read it. But uh, I think raising environmental awareness, working with the children was the strongest thing I could do. And um, so the primary schools from five to, to 11 were the ideal people to work with, not generally on computers, but we had, I set up a healthy uh, schools award, the kids got really interested in it. The kids who'd never ate greens started eating greens. They started growing greens. They started having hens in their playgrounds. And uh, they, uh, we, I got them to write a book about it. It was a great big book. Uh, uh, I, would in, I would encourage the younger, even the younger kids, the three and four year olds, to start cooking and cutting their fingers and things. And we are fortunate another um, Strength of Bristol is that we have a, we're very strong in animation, and Ardman Animations, who create Sean the Sheep, amongst other things, um, are there. And they are good friends. We, we've been brought up together, and I asked them if they would lend their branding and their expertise to creating a game called Sustainable Sean that the kids could play to build their own city. So go to sustainableshawn.com. It's now played across the world. And then I thought, well, let's get every child getting dirty fingers and every child in every primary school to plant a tree, which they did for the first year. And now uh, we've got that as a rolling program. And now that is happening in Japan and Africa and other places. And it, it was just an idea. It's a very cheap idea. It's an incredibly good educational one because it's about food and medicine, environment and everything. And, uh, and it changes people's neighborhoods. And uh, the, it can involve the community as well. Um, and I, I think there's something we, yeah, another great driver is how we don't waste food. Of course, involving academia and business and uh, the, the, the city and university. I came back from Paris with a declaration that we would become carbon zero by 2050, which got the officers nervous. But they said, yeah, we can do that. And we work with the university in, 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 in determining how we can make the, it sounds a long way off, but actually carbon zero is difficult. That is tough. 
And, uh, you know, our resilience project is now beginning to question how we're going to get there. Uh, but it seems uh, vitally important and you have, to, you have to set the targets. We set up our own energy company and it's a wholly owned energy company um, that uh, uh, m m increasing number of Bristol people buy their energy from, but we're also um, spreading it uh, much wider as well um, and, uh, and buying as much of our energy as we can from renewable sources. Um, but I think a lot of this, I move on now to encouraging the local economy. Uh, Tim referred to the Bristol Pound. I didn't start the Bristol Pound. I encouraged the Bristol Pound. It was started by friends of mine. I said, if I get elected, I'll take my salary in Bristol Pounds. And uh, when I got elected, I'll say, we'll, I said, we'll take the taxes, uh, the local taxes, business and uh, house rates in Bristol Pounds. And we will uh, get the bus company to take, because independent bus company, we'll get them to take Bristol Pounds, the train company. So uh, we got some professionals taking it. It's still a minority sport. Don't think that your local currency becomes the main form of currency. But it's a nudge to encourage people to use local markets and, uh, and local businesses. And we had a, I'm really proud of Bristol, we had a riot against Tesco. You know, I mean, what city has a riot against a chain? It's like having a riot against uh, a coffee company or whatever. Uh, and we, uh, we didn't manage to stop them because they're very, you know, they're incredibly powerful, but uh, they, they are running this shop in this very independent, uh, thriving street um, without, a, a, without an alcohol license, which means they can't make a profit. And that, so, you know, and I think this sort of resistance is important. Uh, so it's, uh, and, and we've got to think about how we spend our money. So, and uh, the Bristol Pound becomes a great project because you involve, this, you involve both the professional graphic designers and the kids in, in competition every three years in redesigning the pounds. Um, and uh, we get the street markets all to take them and, uh, and, uh, Oh, how have I got to that? I've already done that one. So maybe I've, you'll find, yeah. And uh, even the developers now have cockened on to the fact that actually it makes a much better heart to your community. Because we have probably the same similar system. We have estate agents, we have uh, property agents in the UK who just have a short list of about 12 to 20 shops that they want you to put into your high street. And the enlightened developers tear up that list and they'll go to anybody who's not on it. And this new street now has 40, in, some in containers, in shipping containers, has 40 independent traders from bike shops to massage to, to food shops to restaurants. And uh, it is thriving and that has only just happened. And I think it's a real lesson. It's an economic lesson for developers. If you want to put up the value of your development, you don't go to Starbucks. You don't go to the, uh, the usual suspects. You, you try something different. Maybe my death warrant was signed. Well, it was signed by several things. One, because I decided to have uh, out all out elections every four years, which we never had, so that it had always been by trickle, you know. And by doing that, of course, I set the whole of the council up against me. But um, the uh, tackling of uh, transport head on was probably the toughest thing. And it's something I think Amsterdam still has to do. Amsterdam has this lovely picture of being a place that is, you know, it's beautiful and it's canals and it's got beautiful buildings and everything. But my God, it could do with a car-free heart to it. It really could. And some people will react against that. And that's what I got strong kickback from, um, from Bristolians. You know, this is a typical street and part of, or not street, a road, highway in part of Bristol. There's a nice street in a very comfortable part of Bristol. These streets were getting absolutely filled up with commuters coming in and parking in the residential areas. And I said, look, the best way of controlling this is actually just to have residential parking schemes so that we take away 40% of the 
um, of the commuter parking ability in one stroke, which was going to take 20 years it would carry on. So I set myself up against the commuters coming into the centre of the city. And they're a strong lobby, but there's no point in doing a job like this if all you're doing is looking over your shoulder at the next election. And um, so I got middle class resistance like you never get. You know, I even had a tank on the streets against me. <laughs> And, you know, I, I mean, I love Bristol Wit. It's good. Um, but we'd done other things before. And uh, before I was mayor, I was involved with um, trying to remove tarmac from the city. And I think we need, just need to look at how we do this. It's a big environmental issue. It's a big uh, livability issue. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd moved, as I said, from, uh, from this old in industry into a more people-centered tourist view of, of the city. Tourism is good in Bristol. It is not overtaken. It's not become a burden, which it's become in, in some cities. Um, and we are reclaiming residential streets, sometimes on a time basis. Um, <laughs> My daughter got a lot of stick because she was my daughter, but she set up a project uh, way before I was mayor called Playing Out, uh, which, uh, which, which reclaimed streets between the end of school and people coming back from work. And that is becoming a national, international movement. Go to playingout.net and you will, you will see it. She had 10 million hits on her last little film she did um, on one of the social, on social media. And I always say, you know, much better to have the a messy, a messy place, but a clean place. Uh, don't be too precious, as I said about, of course, this is nothing to you, you Dutch, but uh, to us, it's really important that we get more people onto, onto bikes. And I didn't have a, I first move as mayor was to take away the parking space for the mayor. And I just had a bike rack. And yeah, that went all over China because people would visit and they'd say, my God, the mayor doesn't have a car. You know, he doesn't, does it. I didn't, yet alone a driver. And uh, so uh, I think that was really important. I tried to change the language. I think we use very negative language. We talk about closing things, stopping things. I talk about opening streets. Opening streets, you know, it's not closing a street, it's opening a street uh, for people. We brought circus into the streets. And uh, this is not, you know, it may seem a bit of a gimmick, but actually it opens people's eyes to, to what their place can be like. And it needn't just be in the center of the city. We have hills, um, so we can do fun things in our streets. Uh, you know, uh, on, and, and so I created this uh, project called uh, make Sunday special, which is an excuse for doing anything on a Sunday, basically, that's legal um, uh, in the community. And the whole idea was to try and create thriving local communities. This is, that is the, uh, my tobacco factory. And this street that was dying is now one of the most thriving streets and with very, very few uh, recognizable names or chains. Uh, and uh, we like to make a noise about it. I even took this band to Bordeaux to visit uh, Alain Juppé, the mayor there, uh, who was a bit surprised. Um, but I think we need to, yeah, you need to make a noise about these things. Otherwise, uh, people don't notice. But always never be afraid to learn from other places. And one of my favorite streets in Europe, in, in Bologna, uh, we got involved a lot of international in, in, uh, engagement. We had huge amounts of uh, EU Commission support with what we were doing. Um, and uh, Green Capital now comes with Euros, which is, uh, it didn't before because I asked, I said. And we got involved directly. A, Bristol as a city uh, was representing cities across the world at the, at the Paris summit. And I felt very proud of that. And it was because we would notice. We, did, we weren't afraid about making a noise about it. So, we, uh, this is the end. These are just diagrams to show that uh, uh, we have thought about resilience. Uh, this is available on the web, so you can read it then, because otherwise I'll be in trouble with Tim, because I'm coming up for the 30 minutes. Um, the obvious things of, of what are the great pillars of resistance, fair, fair city, livable city, sustainable city, agile, really important, being able to make uh, decisions. You know, I was finding, I was having to, I was lumbered with decisions that had been made 10 years ago. 
And we need to be more agile about the way we do things. So uh, new public transport systems, you can't reverse. They were made 10 years ago. And so thinking about how you can, how, how you can uh, adjust things and a well-connected city. And then we turned that into 40 transformative actions with a vision about what the city would be like in 50 years' time. Anyway, I think above all, I would say make a city that's good for children, make a playable city, because that defines everything. It defines the environment, it defines health, it defines social mobility, and children don't have votes, and the politicians often forget them. And they give more time to the drivers than they do to the kids. So my only message to Amsterdam is to make a healthier, fairer, decent city, an even better city than you are, is design everything to be child-friendly. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, before we ask the other speakers to join, um, well, you can say you've certainly breathed some fresh air into how we think about our cities. I don't know if we have Sean the Sheep anytime soon in Amsterdam, but um, <laughs> there's plenty to think about. Um, the thing is, though, that in Amsterdam, um, you spoke about how, well, mayors can change the world, just as Benjamin Barber said, you know, the importance of what mayors are doing. And at the same time, you said don't trust the politicians too much. You should start yourself as a citizen. <laughs> You need to design your own city. So how would you say that in, in, in cities such as Amsterdam, such as Bristol, the relation between the citizen and their politicians should be? Well, I think it's not a matter of not trusting the politicians. I think uh, it's damaging to have that distrust. So it's not a matter of not trusting the politicians, but I think the politicians recognizing that the best job they can do is, the, is to free up, enable citizens to, to take initiatives and to encourage it, sometimes with money. You know, I just think uh, we waste a lot of, uh, we waste a lot of uh, initiatives and opportunities because politicians are suspicious of initiatives that come from outside the council, outside the, the city, uh, the, the city government, government, and think that everything should happen. It's much more economical, yeah. often, for these things to come from the community from the neighborhoods, um, from the street, yeah. than it is from the city hall. And lastly, before we invite the other people, the, you mentioned it once in your talk, it was the term gentrification. Well, if there's one term that people use a lot about Amsterdam right now, it's the gentrification of streets, of neighborhoods. And you say that you shouldn't treat it um, purely negative, because no. sometimes it has this negative connotation. How do you see gentrification and how should we relate ourselves well, to it? Well, it's, I think what's really important is that we recognize what are the good things that come out of the impro improvement. There's a danger we think that any improvement to a place is gentrification. And uh, therefore, uh, we, we are incredibly wary, wary of it. I think that the best balance comes from ensuring that we have social housing in the right places, that social housing isn't all in one place, that it's really, you know, that, it, that it's mixed, that we build council houses, that we build what we call council houses. I don't know why. We've stopped building them in the UK, and I was the first in Bristol to build any council houses for 30 years. Uh, but that's a slow process. And I think we have to have a really strong, um, uh, yeah, a, a strong compensation for gentrification. And uh, yeah, the most successful areas where gentrification has happened is where there is a very strong social structure in terms of affordable housing, in terms of social housing, in terms of hostels, for instance, uh, some, you know, they can, uh, they can help, um, but uh, it's, it's damaging when it prices people right out of the city, which uh, I think is a danger of happening in Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah. So let's turn to the other two speakers. I'd like to invite first Rutger groot wassink who is the political leader of GroenLinks, Green Left. You can choose where you want to sit. And the other speaker is uh, Nadja Awaki. Um, she's a city maker and economist. And I'd like to start with you because the question of gentrification wasn't 
um, uh, a blur or something. Because um, we've been talking about gentrification also in the city. For example, you see it in the Java Straat. And one of the things you initiated is the Java Quartier, in which you try to find ways to combat or at least deal with this process of gentrification. Can you say something about what you did there and how it maybe relates to what you heard in George Ferguson's story? Um, you should take the mic. It's ah, next to you. Yeah. Um, I started a project um, to work with the local shopkeepers uh, because the Diafestraat was gentrifying uh, and also in a very fast pace. And um, I thought that if this would uh, proceed, then they would actually be pushed out <laughs> and we will get a street with a lot of coffee bars, boutiques, but it would be, become a street that would serve only one kind, uh, one type of uh, target group. And um, so I approached the, uh, the, um, the old shopkeepers and uh, I told them there's money coming in, uh, so there's, you can actually take advantage uh, of this process. And um, um, so I helped them um, to see how they can actually um, connect with the new uh, people that came to live in the area. So you walked to inside the local grocery, for example, and you said... Uh, um, um, of course, first I introduced myself, and I yeah. also picked... Uh, uh, <laughs> That's nice of you, yeah. <laughs> and I also picked the shopkeepers in which I saw uh, opportunities, because um, first you actually need uh, a good entrepreneur to uh, be able to work with these changes. And um, I said, um, look, the neighborhood is, is changing. Uh, they were all only competing on price. Um, and uh, they didn't really knew how to uh, um, take advantage. Uh, so we just uh, had a look. And for instance, um, there was this shop. Uh, uh, and from the outside, it looked like a, a regular uh, grocery shop. Well, if you got in, it was actually a deli with uh, um, a lot of unique products. Uh, they also had one of the best falafel uh, in town. <laughs> but for the new tenants, they couldn't really see this from the outside. So we changed uh, the appearance of the shop. Um, we add in some nice uh, graphic design. Uh, but at the same time, we did it in such a way that it would also um, uh, push their old customers away. So it was really about finding a so balance. So wouldn't push old customers away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so finding the balance to serve the old clients, but also take advantage of the money that's actually coming in yeah. the neighborhood. Um, and it's actually working, so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, it is a process, so it's not just about coming in and saying, okay, do this, do that, and it will all be okay. So it's really about um, um, uh, making them aware of the possibilities, making them aware of their own strength. Yeah. Like you actually have something here, uh, like these other shops that are coming in, they have nice coffee, but y you also have something unique to offer. Yeah, expensive, <laughs> expensive coffee. <laughs> Um, and at the same time, we started a digital platform uh, to enhance the community sense in the neighborhood because most of the people that come in, they don't know uh, uh, what the street actually has to offer. Um, and we also try to um, create awareness uh, around local shopping because yeah. everybody talks about these nice streets and independent shops and that's also why they actually came to live in this kind of areas. Yeah, but they all buy their books on bol.com. Exactly, yeah. or they go to uh, the Albert Heijn uh, to do the shopping. So mm. it's really about also um, um, creating this awareness uh, um, with the citizens yeah. that they actually have a critical role to play in... Uh, um, maintaining the character. Maintaining the, the character uh, in the community. Yeah, yeah. Rutger yeah. when you listen to George's story, you're, well, aspiring to be one of the people who can turn the knobs about what's going to happen in Amsterdam. What did you pick out of his speech that you thought is relevant for Amsterdam and we should relate to right now? Because I saw you scribbling down some things. Yeah, the main question is what isn't? Um, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I think mm -hmm. that it, it, um, uh, I strongly feel connected with a lot of things that, that George has said. For example, when you uh, said something about a car-free city center, uh, that 
it made me giggle because it's one of the things which is in our political program and a lot of people hated me about it. Uh, yeah, they will. Uh, yeah, just don't care. Um, With luck, they don't vote in Amsterdam, you know. Yeah, but um, <laughs> um, I think the, 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 the most inspiring thing in, in uh, your story is maybe um, the attitude of rebellion. Uh, and the, the 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 attitude of breaking rules and the attitude of um, moving forward as a city and in, in, from the from the the concept and the idea that uh, change can be made in a city and not not on a, on a, on a national level and um, being in local politics uh, I, I experience I experience that a lot, a lot of times for example even when we think about the way we handle refugees. Uh, we know what's best to do in our city. Uh, if you talk about, um, uh, for example, uh, mobility, we know what's best here. And I feel that uh, a, a lot of uh, cities um, uh, share way more, uh, um, I mean, some of the larger cities share way more uh, than um, cities in the Netherlands do. And I feel that these um, um, yeah, large cities um, can be the the, 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 the kickstarter of change. And I know, for example, that hey, what we have, what we experience with uh, Airbnb mm. is the same that uh, Barcelona mm. or mm. Berlin experiences with Airbnb. And I feel strongly the, the, the urge almost to connect with, with these cities and to seek uh, solutions for our uh, questions which go way beyond regulations that are already um, in, 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 in national law or stuff yeah. like that. So mm -hmm. I think this attitude, and uh, of course I'm enthusiastic when, it's, when, you, when you say something about being, uh, if you mention anarchism, uh, I'm already, uh, you already got me going. With uh, a small A. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I think the most important mm. is this attitude of not, uh, let's not stop yourself by rules, but by the, the chances that lay ahead. Yeah, because where are we right now as a city, Nadja? Because you have done um, many studies, and in 2004, for example, you've already worked in, in city-making in Amsterdam. If you look at the, at the curve of a city, it grows so sometimes, it shrinks, things go well, things go wrong. What did you see change in the years, and where are we right now? Um, I think in the beginning of 2000, in the 90s, we were really working on making cities attractive again, making them attractive for um, highly educated people, uh, for expats, companies, uh, renovating uh, uh, urban areas. And we did a great job, uh, I think especially in Amsterdam. I think it's one of the most attractive mm. cities in the world. We don't have uh, any problems attracting companies, expats, etc. Um, so I really think that we reached a stage uh, in which the challenge is to actually keep the city uh, inclusive for everybody and to create opportunities for the citizens themselves instead of serving uh, um, uh, the bigger companies. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that's a really a paradigm shift uh, uh, which should happen yeah. that we start working on what is best for our citizens, what kind of economics does actually benefit the city instead of uh, uh, yeah. um, the global economy. Yeah. George? The, the, there was a recent uh, social media campaign in Bristol that let's make Bristol shit again. <laughs> 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 because a lot of people <laughs> thought it got too good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it was, that was tongue in cheek. But one thing I think is really important that you picked up on was uh, you can't make good change without breaking some rules, you know, and don't stick to the rules. And that applies to widths of streets, you know, physical things and social things. I think we've just got to be prepared to question the rules. But at the same time, you see two um, routes going. There is the route of Amsterdam becoming more international, more, um, um, I mean, the Brexit showed we tried to get, well, we won between Brexit, the medicine agency came to the Netherlands. And at the same time, people have um, um, longing or attached to the local to what the city is. So you have the international, the shift we're taking, and the local. How do you combine those two, Rutger, or? Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think you put it quite right. 
I mean, we are an international city. This will never change. We've been yeah. an international yeah. city for 100 years. Uh, yeah. This will never change. Mm. But the, the, the question is, what kind of city do you want to be? Uh, and if you mention Brexit, uh, there's been a huge debate in, in, in the city council. Should we actively try to get these banks and international companies to come to Amsterdam? Um, uh, and if they did, um, the only thing we would know for sure is that the, 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 the prices of real estate would go up. Uh, and, and I think that, that most of the leftist parties really had the idea of what's in it for us. Why should we have this, this fast capital moving into our cities? Because uh, the main thing it delivers is shitty jobs. Um, so the main question as a city and a city councillor is for me is, what kind of city do you want to be? Not in four years, but in maybe 50 years span is, is too long. But yeah, let's it make it, it 30 yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, 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 and let's see what mm -hmm. happens then. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we know that each year uh, 11,000 people come to Amsterdam. If we had affordable housing, uh, that number would double or triple. Um, so if there's a huge pressure on Amsterdam, what does it mean if you don't, um, if, if, if you're not able and willing to make political choices? It means exactly the things that George was talking about: social inequality, uh, uh, um, segregation in space, um, and, uh, unaffordable housing, all these kinds of stuff. So this is this is about making political choices. This is about investing in. Um, uh, in, in affordable housing. For example, when we talked about the Javastraat, I strongly feel that as city government, you should um, buy real estate. If you don't buy real estate yeah, in the totally city agree. center, yeah. uh, it means we're screwed by, yeah. by, by big yeah. companies and capital. Mm, yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, is what you did in Bristol and what, what Amsterdam is facing is that in, in a way we have to um, reclaim our own position and we have to reclaim uh, our own dominance and not market dominance. Yeah. I totally agree about buying real estate. I bought real estate around the station yeah. because I saw that as absolutely key. <laughs> not for us necessarily, but what in order to be able to determine more what happens to it. It gives so you we an got instrument. The university, yeah. Yeah. So we've now got the university setting up a second campus by the station. But, but, yeah. but, but aren't you too negative about companies and investors in that? So because I read, mm. and, and I'm quoting the, the investor in the parole, he said, well, you do as if all we do is um, we buy uh, real estate and then we uh, are punches smelker or we are the, the people who uh, let other people pay a lot of money. But at the same time, we are the ones who create apartments. Mm. And it, well, it, is there a bridge between those two worlds? Because yeah. sometimes it sounds as if um, big companies, uh, investors are the bad guys, we should reclaim it all, and then our city is ours again. No, no, that, that's way too easy. Uh, but if you see that, that, that one third of the houses in West uh, is bought without any conditions to stop this, the, 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 the buying of the house, it means that there's a huge influx of people or investors with, with, with capital, uh, with, which um, uh, can take a huge position in the city. You really have to ask, is that what you want for your city? If you look at some of the city center, and that's why I said that we should buy real estate in the city center, but I also feel that, for example, in Javastraat, uh, Haarlemmerstraat, uh, so that's not only city center. You, sh you should have strategic uh, real estate. Um, um, if you completely let it go, um, who's going to live there? Because if you look at, at, we have some examples, not only London, which is like the nightmare for Dutch politicians, for Amsterdam politicians, yeah. but also in Stockholm and in other cities, if, if housing is completely uh, in, in, in private hands, um, who is going to guarantee that, that yeah. it will stay affordable? Who's going to guarantee that they won't let it stay empty yeah. uh, uh, and wait for somebody to pay, like, what? Yeah. 1,500 euros, 2,000 euros a month? Nadja, because we're in Amsterdam, we are so busy growing now. If you read the newspapers, it says we should build more houses. Point. Dot. And that's 
what we're aiming for. What should, according to you, be um, um, the vision behind that if we want, well, you're, bu you're busy working on an inclusive city. So what's the concrete angle that we should address when we talk about how we're going to grow? Um, you already talked about social housing. I think it's key. Uh, and I think that Amsterdam um, has quite a good position. We have, still have a lot of uh, social housing within the city center and outside of the city. And I think it's something that we should uh, really preserve uh, uh, to make it a city that, is, uh, that has uh, uh, opportunities for everybody to get involved. Um, so yeah, we have to build more because it's an attractive city and we have to grow. Uh, um, but at the same time, um, um, create housing um, for everybody. So for the um, Well, the middle class, class is quite a problem, right? Yeah. People are talking about. Yeah. But we made a big mistake creating huge housing estates. And I think hundreds of small sites are just as appropriate for social housing as a few big, or more appropriate for social housing than a few big sites. Otherwise, you're creating more social division, really. Mm. Yeah. I think that we have to, to we, yes, uh, w there should be affordable housing for middle groups as well, but the question is, what are middle groups? Uh, in, in the political mm. discussions, um, um, some people say that, yeah, it's still a middle group if your rent is between, let's say, seven and 1,500 euros. I wouldn't call that a middle group. Um, um, and I think that the main focus should be on affordable housing, whatever that may be. If you look at housing right now, buying a house is way cheaper uh, than renting a house. And we should, have, uh, we should have extra space and we should have extra larger extra space. But for example, if you look at the city center, there are uh, uh, neighborhoods in the city center where there's hardly any social housing uh, and you should see if you can still make sure that there's some kind of diversity in housing because if you don't mm -hmm. uh, preserve yeah. this diversity mm -hmm. in housing then what you get is um, monocultural neighborhoods and that's that's i think something we should be scared yeah. of and how would you say because George is talking about a resilient city. How resilient are we as Amsterdam? Are we in a good state? Are we, do we have a good social fabric that... Because there's also the image of the haves and the have-nots that's growing. Saskia Sasse thought us about expulsions, people that are driven away. How resilient are we? I'm quite sure that there, there is. Um, I think that if your if you're analysis is that this city of Amsterdam is highly commercialized uh, and yes social inequality is a result of that so there is a, a, a huge factor of social inequality if you look at housing if you look at health for example um, if you look at, 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 at work there there is social inequality so we're I'm, I'm, I, I can't put a, a, f a number on that how resilient yeah. we are but and I'm, I'm quite sure that not everything is lost yet um, and I feel that, 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 that we can make a change. And I think that the elections are about making a change and that we are on a tipping point uh, 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 in making a change and making hard political choices. And um, I think that, that, that there's still a possibility to make uh, a better uh, future for Amsterdam. And I feel that we should have roadmaps for your resilience is, in a way is, is providing roadmaps for transition. Mm -hmm. And we should have these roadmaps for transition as well. For example, if you look at our energy strategy, if you look at... Should we have our own energy company just as Bristol? Oh, yeah, I'm strongly in favor of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but we used to we have used that. that yeah. A lot of cities I'm, I'm, used to. I'm, German I'm, cities are now yeah. getting their own energy company. Yeah. They've been doing it for longer than us. <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm strongly in favor of our own social mm -hmm. housing company. Mm -hmm. uh, so. If, if, you, if you want to reclaim uh, uh, your yes. position as a, as a city, uh, I think that, that you should have these kinds of interventions and you should try to, to, to disrupt the market. Yeah. I want to go to the audience after one more question because I think there are a few questions. But would we then also, as a city council, may, maybe George, first your take, would you say that because we define often our policy making in terms of economic growth, because eh, if we grow, we do well as a city. Should we be um, willing to um, um, let go of that idea of growth and accept a less wealth 
if it makes us more inclusive? Because I always hear in the talks we should be more inclusive, we should do this, more social housing, everyone should live there and there, but it's about choices. When you do something, it has consequences on the other side. How do you see well, that? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's about less of anything. I think greater well-being. And uh, we need to find new ways of measuring success, don't we? GDP is a crap way of measuring success. I mean, it, it, you have a higher GDP if you have accidents, you have higher GDP if you have drugs and illness, and it, you know, the more people who go into hospital, everything bad adds to your GDP. I don't mean the good things don't as well. But we need to create a... Uh, you know, not maybe quite a Bhutan system of, of, uh, of uh, gross national happiness, but something that's a balance between that and uh, mm. GDP. And yes, I think most people, if, they prop if it's properly explained, would sign up to a city that was going to create a better place for their kids to grow up in, because that is my measure, than uh, whether they're going to uh, get top dollar for their house or their job. Nadia? I couldn't agree more. Yeah. 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 And cities time. can do yeah. that. I mean, we as a city have created something called Happy City. It's, yeah. it's, uh, we haven't. It's one of those people out there with a bit of initiative who's created this organization called Happy City, who's, uh, and you can go on the web and see that, and they've, <laughs> created, and they've started creating this index. Yeah. Um, other people are doing it in the States and other places, but we've got to move faster to create that index. So. We, it's how we measure success, not whether we have it. Yeah. Yeah. And who's yeah. actually having these uh, successes? It's not for everybody. If you have economic growth through GDP, yeah. who is actually benefiting from this growth? Mm. I don't think yeah. it's, the, it's the citizens. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But Amsterdam is the economic motor of the Netherlands. I saw that if, if Amsterdam... I, 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 I didn't understand the sentence in the framing it was, but... Um, the wealth of the Netherlands would decrease with 5.7% if Amsterdam wasn't there. And, and, and the subtext was, and I, I want to, to, to ask it to you, um, are we a responsible city when we decide, huh, we, because the money that's made in the Netherlands is increasingly earned in Amsterdam. So the tourists that are coming and, and, and everything that we as Amsterdam people might want to put a little bit of a stop on, there are other areas in the Netherlands that also profit from it. So, so um, how do you look at that? Should we be a responsible capital in the sense that we are also the place where the money is made? So if we accept less growth, that's a long yeah, question. No, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm not quite sure if I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proper question as such. Because um, you're asking about responsibilities. And I, th I feel as a, as, as a city councillor that my responsibility is mainly uh, making sure that people in Amsterdam, that Amsterdam is still an, an okay city. And I, I don't believe the frame that money is only brought up in Amsterdam. I think it's the region. And I think way more fundamental is the question, it's the title of a book by, I think, uh, 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 father and son Skidelsky, uh, how much is enough? And we really yeah. should ask ourselves, yeah. how much is enough? For our own way of living, yeah. for the way our, we, 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 have, we live in our city, and I'm not, I'm, I don't have a, a, a fit answer, but let's have a fundamental discussion. As a city, how much is enough? What do we want to be? Who are we as city of Amsterdam? Because I feel that we, we never ask ourselves these questions. Yes. And the, the, if, the, if this question is, is posed, it's answered by, uh, by, a, by a, only a small faction of yeah. the people from Amsterdam. So. Yeah. What would be your answer, Naja? Um, what do we, we are, yeah, as, as what a city. What do we want to be? Um, yeah, I think um, that we should have this discussion in the first place. Uh, because how I experience at the moment is that we... Uh, we don't actually have a vision for the city, uh, who we are, um, um, why are we doing things that the things that we are doing. Shocking. It is because we we have this economic strategy uh, of growth and uh, uh, and then we have like social. Yes, we should take care of the people that are vulnerable and uh, uh, we have to be social. But this is it has to be one story, um, combining the social with the economics, with the environmental issues, and to create one vision 
uh, how this all can work together in a balanced way. Can I ask a dangerous question? Does that work better in Rotterdam? <laughs> They're trying to be Amsterdam, so they will... Uh, All right. Okay. <laughs> it was a question, not this. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Eric the Monk. Um, a wonderful story, by the way. George Ferguson. Oh, of course, you introduce yourself by George. Very good. Um, I think Bristol is a, is a very, very good pilot for the sustainability of the world. Um, but my question is about the chain, about the investments in the old fashioned energy, uh, fossil energies. Um, what should we do to break through the chain? Um, because it will last, I think, 30 to 50 years. Uh, to break through the chain, because we have to overcome the, this inertia, this big mass of old fashioned energies, for old fashioned way of thinking, the way of thinking of the more and more economics. What should we do more to to reply, to accelerate this whole process. Yeah. Well, I mean, our only power as individuals <coughs> is spending power, isn't it? So I think the, the best thing we can do is, as community, as families, as communities, as uh, organizations, is to get much more serious about how and where we spend our money. Um, I think that is, the, that is going to create faster change than uh, than any democratic uh, electoral change. But is it more for the next and next generations? Well, that's why I think, yeah, you start with the kids, but I don't think you need to wait, and I don't think we can afford to wait for the next generation. But I, I rely on kids putting the pressure on. Yeah. <laughs> why, you know, why, why are we eating this junk? Uh, why are we buying this crap? You know, I think that's... That is, it's got to be the way, um, because kids are open to change in a way. I have a collective noun for those who, um, who, who resist change, as adults. And, uh, you know, I found you, you go to the schools and they would love, you know, love a conversation about radical change. But uh, we adults are pretty slow at it. So uh, I don't think it's all the answer, but I do think see kids as educators, not just as waiting for the next generation to behave better. There's also a question here. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ferguson. Uh, as an urban citizen, I can agree with your story, but you didn't get re-elected. And ah. we have uh, uh, elections in our, uh, in our municipality or in our council. Uh, what did you learn and what can you advise, for instance, to Mr. Groot Wassink to sell your story yeah. politically better? Yeah, We've turned I it mean, now into a green left brainstorm yeah. campaign session. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I, I yeah. think there are two fact. I think there are two factors in me not getting elected. Of which one was the overriding factor is that I didn't have an organisation, a party. Um, I had friends. I had uh, people. I didn't have a membership. Um, so uh, uh, that when it came to a second election, because I took people by surprise in the first election, you, you, you know, as an independent and the only independent in a senior political position in the whole of the UK in parliament or city governance, it was a rarity. I realized it was, I was living dangerously. And there was no point in pussyfooting around because uh, what would be the point? What would be the point of my age of spending four years wasting time just trying to get reelected? Because that's what politicians do. So I think, yes, you've got to choose your battles. But do what you believe in. But try and create, you know, try and get more allies than I managed to get along the way. Um, and I think you can do that as part of a party, maybe, that you can't do as an independent. But I'm a, I'm a great advocate for independence. I do think that it's crazy that we've allowed national... Uh, politics to have seeped into all our local politics because it, they're very different things and everybody who gets elected to represent a city should represent that city first and not be pulled and pushed by their political party but um, yes be brave but choose your battles and make sure you've got a lot of support when the next election comes in terms of organization um, I got more votes second time than I did first time. What they did is got their vote out. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in a way I won. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a short intermezzo because I'm curious, because it was a question that, that... Unfortunately, we have to have a new mayor also in Amsterdam. Would you be in favor of an elected mayor? Strongly in favor. I think that Eberhardt um, maybe shows that uh, um, a lot of people are scared about choosing a mayor because they say the populist will win. I think that Eberhardt would have won with a North Korean communist uh, outcome. Um, so, I, yeah. But was he an exception or? No, I don't think okay. so. Yeah. No, I, don't, I, I think that in the end, reason will win. Uh, and I strongly feel that that people will vote for the best uh, uh, for, for the best man or woman for the job. So, hmm. I think I'm strongly in favor of choosing uh, yeah. uh, these representatives. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I first go should there. Wait, yeah. Should, should we wait appointing the next mayor until this uh, law has passed in uh, Parliament? Because <laughs> this law is supposed to uh, uh, be uh, coming up in the next half year to year. Um, should we, should we wait or should we appoint another mayor for the next six years before that law is passed? The, the, the temporary mayor made me promise that he could leave in July. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure when this legislation will uh, come through. Uh, and I think that it's, if it would have been, if, uh, if, if, you, if it was guaranteed within half a year, then I would be in favor because uh, I strongly feel that, it's, that yeah. it's better to choose. But if it takes more than a year or even a year and a half, then I'm not quite sure if that's okay. Because we need a mayor. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to go to you and then I come to you because I promise. Uh, a little bit of context and then my question. Hi, George. I'm Anna Kinnear. I'm Bristol born and bred. Oh, uh, hello. I voted <laughs> for you as well. I go to the tobacco factory every Christmas. I buy my bread in Marks. I moved to Amsterdam a year and a half ago. Um, I'm director of a social enterprise called Makeiversity. We are based on the Marina Terrain, which is uh, a new development. It's an old Navy base. Um, we are a co-making space for 77 startup creative and tech businesses. Great. Uh, we have ex uh, extraordinarily high rent and uh, we are finding it hard to um, connect with the government, the local city councils, etc., and with corporates to provide funding to make sure that we, as a startup who've been here for a year, can survive so that our 77 businesses who are based here can also survive because without our workshop facilities, uh, their businesses wouldn't be able to exist. What advice can you give to me in activating uh, the councils and the government to help support an initiative like a co-making space, make adversity? Well, they need to realise the value of it. It sounds a bit like Hamilton House in Bristol, you know, Hamilton, where um, there was a developer that uh, had an empty office building to let at £15 a square foot. Big, big empty office building. And some people came to him and said, well, what's the point of having an empty office building at £15 a square foot? We'll fill it at £7.50 a square foot. Uh, so that's what they did. And that lasted for seven or eight years and has been great success. Now the developers got greedy because uh, these people have basically saved their bacon because they were in trouble with the banks. Um, and now they've, uh, you know, they w would have gone bust now, they, now they're in a safe position, they're now putting the rents up. I think we need, to, we, need, we need to look at these empty, I don't know if you've got empty office buildings and empty, we actually, empty we stuff. We have policy in, for this in yeah, Amsterdam. Because, yeah. it, I mean, it is desperately stupid. But, but uh, I, I couldn't as mayor intervene in such yeah. things as that. But the city council should do all it can to help subsidize uh, organizations like yours or twist the arms of others to do so because it's incredibly valuable to the local, yeah. uh, to the local economy yeah. in a very positive way. I, I'd yeah. like to add, Nadja, because you have experience with that because at the Java Quartier you worked with the city council, right? They helped you in making this possible. Yeah, and on this specific topic, uh, we have uh, a Broeplaatsenbeleid in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, so we have this agency that works together with developers, housing corporations uh, to develop affordable workspaces for uh, artists, uh, uh, social entrepreneurs, 
So we actually have this policy. The only thing that is that the demand is very high uh, and um, the spaces that are actually available to, to redevelop into affordable uh, workspaces are getting less and less. So yeah, the policy is there, but it's not sufficient, I think, to uh, serve uh, the total demand. Yeah, Rutger? No, I was just going to say that I'm more than happy to talk to you about this specific case on the marine terrain. And um, let's afterwards exchange uh, telephone numbers and email and then uh, let's make an appointment and talk about it. Because if there, there is something I can do, uh, because I think that um, a lot of parties in the Gemeenteraad see, uh, in the city council, see that mm -hmm. these kinds of, uh, of entrepreneurship and these kinds of developments are very valuable for uh, a city uh, as Amsterdam. And I have to say that, uh, yeah, I like the Broedplaatsbeleid. I think it's, it's, it's okay, but even more is needed. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is uh, organized anarchism, uh, and we need anarchism as well. Um, but let, I, I can see what, let's see what okay. I can do. Okay, so, and, and, and call us if he doesn't respond, because then we'll know <laughs> him. Um, you have a question. Yeah, um, Jan Schreven. Um, from my professional background, I am asked also about uh, politics uh, in, in Bristol. I, I understood that you were able to kick out party politics, in, from, at least from your team. Uh, and um, my question is, how is it now? Is, is Westminster ca came back in, into Bristol and now majority party is ruling and says, well, we, we are elected, so we uh, are yeah. the boss? Well, the... Um Basically, all the cities in the UK, except a couple in Scotland, are now run by Labour, which is the opposition in Parliament. So we have a very strange situation. Um, um, Bristol, for instance, is four Labour members of Parliament, is a Labour majority on the council. Uh, the mayor, in the, the new Labour mayor, said he would continue my rainbow cabinet because that was popular. Uh, actually, what he did is he put three, he more than doubled the size of the cabinet because it gives more allowances to more people. Um, he more than double sized the cabinet and then uh, put three uh, places out of ten to the other parties. Now, only two weeks ago, he's decided that's a nuisance, so he's now completely one party cabinet again. So it's just gone back to the old system. And that is a shame. He's a nice guy. I get on well with him. He regards me as a bit of an ambassador for Bristol. We work together. But the fact is, the honest answer to your question is yes, it's gone back to party politics. A, a really short follow-up? Yes, for, for Rutherford, because Amsterdam is highly politicized. Politized, uh, politicized. Uh, the, the, the coalition is ruling and the, the opposition that, uh, doesn't have anything to say, which is a nuisance, of course, and uh, as, especially because the citizens don't have anything to say. Uh, it's only the, 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 the city council, the city uh, hall where uh, is government. How, how, how do you notice that? Maybe you can give an example of where you noticed it. There has been a, a report of an expert committee last year for, to, uh, to look at, uh, to evaluate local democracy in Amsterdam. And they published this report while well, you read it and you see what happened there. Uh, my question to Rotter is, how will you get this changed okay. for next year? There's no easy answer for that. Uh, the first thing I would do is that I... Um, um, because I completely agree with you. I, what we have seen with the, the local uh, democratic structures, uh, they're just tor torn down. And, um, but I'm not quite sure if just restoring what we had is the proper way to move forward. What I feel is that we should, in, in a way, um, um, it's end democratic structures and the way civilians participate in uh, decision making. These two aspects uh, should be redesigned bottom up. Uh, uh, and for me as a city, city councillor and maybe as an alderman, who knows, uh, um, the first thing to do is to, um, to talk with people and to see what's already uh, uh, organized grassroots and to see what we can 
um, export throughout the city, and maybe it means that you'll have a different model of uh, uh, democracy in the north of Amsterdam than you have in the south. If that is the case, I wouldn't mind, but I'm, I'm not going to say it's going to be like this or it's going to have to be like that, because I strongly feel that it should be something that we should redesign as city council, as civilians, as um, so, a city so altogether. If you become the biggest, because we've kind of dismissed the, um, um, the local councils yeah. in Amsterdam, the Stadsdelen mm -hmm. are, well, changed in a way, yeah. killed, yeah. you call it killed. Yeah. Um, w would you then try to reinstate them again if, if, if you were elderman? No, only if, the, if that's the outcome of the political process we as a city should have. Because uh, I don't think that it would do any good if uh, a new city uh, government would just rein, in, rein, uh, reinstate, yeah. reinstate the, the, the old structures. I think that a more, way more fundamental discussion is needed. Yeah. What does local democracy mean? And what does participation in decision making mean? Because mm -hmm. if the, the report that, that Jan is referring to is saying that the way it was organized uh, was already lacking. Uh, and so. Mm. Why, should go, why, why should I go back to a system yeah. that was failing already? Yeah. Okay, there's a question here. Hello, um, I have a question for George. Um, my name is Edward, I'm myself IT architect. It was really beautiful the way you had your strategy clear and people involved have their dreams come true, I mean, or to be involved, to voice heard. I'm not looking for a way to have a kind of such a web to connect all cities with the people who are connected to the city themselves and also to planet Earth. Um, what's your view to, to make a strategy with people, local people involved and the currency, the, the Bristol Pound, um, to make that happen so they have a contra currency uh, regarding normal currency, so kind of cryptocurrency, whatever, and to make people worldwide connected? For, yeah. And could you maybe help with that to make that more clear? Well, to make the local global. To make the lo local local. <laughs> Yeah. For example, when you travel by plane, why don't we invest that airplanes that um, by fueling in the air, for example, and that we all people invest in that uh, so that uh, airplanes uh, pollution is lowered, for example. So their strategy is this now not being picked up by countries, and I think there are way decentral ways to invest in new technology that's flexible yeah. to accelerate climate change or climate challenge. Well, I, yeah. I think what you do is already with the, the Global Parliament of Mayor, for example, you're building this network, right? You're trying to do that. Yeah, the Global Parliament of Mayors, for example, is, a, is the example, I think. Um, obviously, there are, other, there are other groupings, but uh, I think that's, that, that's the one that is uh, set up to do what you're talking about. Um, whether it whether it takes off, I don't know. It's 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 looking promising. Even though Ben Barbas, who invented the whole thing, sadly died last year. What could people, uh, IT architects, what could IT people do to support the part of the? Oh, communication. I think the you know. Net network communication is uh, absolutely vital, so people know what's going on everywhere. Um, that is uh, so. IT people can certainly help the global parliament of mayors operate in a virtual way, rather than having to meet, because it's not practical for them to have to meet too often. Uh, once a time, year, yeah. once a year is enough, and it's only going to be a minority of the yeah. cities represented. So it's got to be a. Uh, uh, a, a crypto parliament. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're getting close to rounding off, I think. So I just want to see how many questions are there. There's one there. You have a question. Let's do those two. And then if there's one person who says, I have this question I need to ask, otherwise I can't sleep, then there's one more opportunity. But then it has to be a good one because the rest is being kept off their drink. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Derek. And um, uh, there's so much brilliance here on the city side that I don't know what to do. I, I just moved from San Diego, which is not really a very um, great city at all. Uh, a beautiful place. And nice weather. The, the weather's just fantastic. <laughs> <coughs> and I don't need rain pants. Um, 
Okay, the, the comments about character I thought were so interesting because, um, you know, we live in a, a, a capitalist society, a, a social capitalist society, but, but we, we love markets uh, and, and, and we need character. And there's the challenge of, of gentrification that seems to come when the edge is lost, when, when the character is drained mm. from, from the place. But, but what is that character? What, what is the sort of vibe of, of, of the cities? And, and how do you support that? It's so intangible. And um, so you mentioned something specific about your engagements with developers. And that I thought was very interesting because every city has to engage with developers. And this idea that they've got this menu, this sort of plan, this sort of expected set of patterns that they come in and they build, and, and, and that's where the character goes. Are there ways of, of, of engaging there on the developer side to give them a broader palette that would help not just Amsterdam but also yeah. other places? So actually there are two, two, two questions. How, how can you find this character and what is it and how can you incorporate it into a vision of when developers start building and scheming their plans? Well, okay. character as you know it when you see it, it's always very difficult to define it. But I, I think the, uh, I think councils, city governments have got to be very prepared to engage very directly with developers um, in partnership with a small p but i mean in uh in trying to find mutual benefit of of working to make a better place and uh, uh you know I, th I think that is help opening their opening their eyes by pointing to good examples of where the uh the non-standard way of doing things uh, works better. And yeah, there are some good examples. I look to places usually in Sweden or, Copen or, or in Denmark or, uh, for examples because we don't have enough in, in the UK. But, um, so the best way is to take them to a place where it's working and, mm. uh, and, and say, how can we make this work together in our own local way yeah. rather than just copying what's done. Yeah. Before we go to Rutger, Nadja, maybe also because the Java Straat is, is such an iconic street actually in Amsterdam which maybe captures a bit of this character what we're looking for in Amsterdam. How would you define the character of the Java Street that is your backbone for what you're doing right now? It's the people who actually uh, give identity to the place, who give character. So it's in my idea, really preserving uh, the soft infrastructure, the mm. people uh, mm. that mm. actually give uh, the street or a certain neighborhood uh, an actual face. Yeah. Yeah. It's the people. Mm. Yeah. Rutger, how do you combine, because you also are in all these meetings that are about the Sluisbuurt, uh, Zeeburger Island in North, they're going to build so much houses. And he's asking, how can we get that character into those new plans that we are developing? Do you have a, what's your backbone when you enter such discussions about developments in Amsterdam? I strongly feel that character cannot be developed. Character is something that's there or isn't. Uh, but still, we're developing. Yeah, but, but no, character is, 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 is a free space. Character is non-regulations. Character is people. Character is um, um, uh, uh, let, let the... Uh, uh, allowing counterculture to be part of your city, allowing um, people to do what what they yeah. want to do without interfering, uh, and so I'm I'm not I don't I don't think that you can develop or design character. What you can do is that you can make sure that there are certain spaces, for example, for broedplaats or for uh, that there are um, 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 that, that it's non it's a, not a monocultural uh, uh, neighborhood, for example. But that's, that's not the defying thing for character. So you can't then, be, because that's, that, also feels, yeah, they can, that also feels a bit difficult, before I go to the last question, because at the same time, you have to write this paragraph, this page, this, this A4 that says, this is what we're going to do in that place. Mm -hmm. This is how we're going to build it. Mm -hmm. But then you say you can't write character into it. No, but then you're no, waiting for what happens. No, definitely not. But it's a complete illusion that you can just uh, hmm? write down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and of course. And but so, no. But look, look at look at look at our neighborhoods. Uh, uh, the neighborhood where I live in, the Stadsleidebuurt, hmm. it has been 
built uh, 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 around the 900, yeah. 1900s for uh, workers. A uh, hundred years later, it was the squatting center of the world. Uh, and now it's a gentrified but still diverse uh, neighborhood. Um, there's no such thing as a solid, unmoving, steady character. Character is, is, is an ongoing yeah. process. It's, 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 it's fluent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Naja? Yeah. yeah, but I do think that if you look at developers, um, it's about looking the short term versus the long term. And it's also about willing to taking risks because as a sure. developer, so if you have the Albertine or the, uh, sure. the big uh, uh, companies, you're uh, sure that they're going to pay the rent, uh, it's going to be safe, etc. But creating a neighborhood is also about being uh, willing to invest in the long term to actually create space. Yeah, it's creating, and, about creating space even yeah. more than about designing character. Exactly. And, Where local and, entrepreneurs and it, can step in, lo local artists. Exactly, local, like yeah. uh, local entrepreneurs, yeah. they, uh, they should, there should be space for them to uh, develop an audience. Uh, uh, you should invest in public space for people to interact. Hmm. So it's really about setting the, um, uh, um, the framework for character to be able to develop. Yeah. Uh, but if you choose for uh, the short term and no risk at all, then you just take the big companies and you have something which is risk free, but also has no character. No character, yeah. yeah. George, yeah. short edition. Just very briefly, yeah. it's about breaking down monocultures and encouraging the maximum mix and diversity within a place. Yeah. Taking risks. Yeah. There's a question here. I I think uh, uh, Javastad is a clear example, and also the Staatsliedenburg, about character, that uh, the people are the character, but these people, uh, one generation ago, were completely different. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, well, uh, not, in, not in the Staatsliedenburg. Yeah, oh, no, it, it changed I, I, a couple I, of times. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. change there. But uh, that... That was not the question I wanted to ask. Uh, Rutger, I wanted to ask you, uh, and, uh, but uh, one more thing about character and how you do can influence it. Piet Heinkade is one of the examples, I think, where it completely failed uh, and where you, you do need uh, to create public space. You need, do need to create a plint, I don't know the English word for that, uh, which works. And if you don't actively uh, create that, then the... Uh, so setting, environment yeah. is not is not inviting to uh, to be on the streets. But the the thing that I wanted to ask you is, there is now uh, how are you? Uh, do you think you can influence the speed of development in the coming years? Because part of the uh, pressure that we are feeling now, I think, is because of the lack of urgency in the last 10, 15 years. We haven't been building enough. Uh, we haven't created the infrastructure. We are still waiting for the North South Line to start to uh, go. It's now 15 years mm -hmm. after starting uh, building it. As soon as that one is uh, going, we have a new area in North that all of a sudden becomes attractive. Uh, how can you help speed up things in the coming five years to really build houses and create infrastructure so that we enlarge the city, so that we can accommodate people within an area that is only 15, 20 minutes around the city center and, and make it and has character. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, you're making it an extremely complex uh, yeah. question. Your, your will be that position in yeah, but, but, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but I'm still going to give you an, an, the honest answer is that I'm ju I just don't know uh, uh, if we will completely do it, uh, uh, and, and I'm quite sure we'll make mistakes. For example, the Pita and Kade you mentioned, uh, there's still, there's a huge road uh, which, which cuts it off completely of the rest of the neighborhood. There's hardly any green, uh, so which is clearly a failed street, in my, from my point of view. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, uh, uh, a capitalistic boulevard, but it has nothing to do with the pack houses that used to be there. Um, so, if you ask me, what will I do? Is that I have a, um, I have some principles to alongside. I want to look, and it's is there enough affordable housing? How is public space organized? Is there the possibility for economic activity? <coughs> activity? Uh, is there um, is there space for being different? Uh, and being different can be. Is there space for artists? 
Is there space, for example, uh, the housing of refugees? Is there space for woongroepen? Uh, um, Living groups, housing yeah. groups. Yeah, <laughs> no, but, but that, but that, that, these things uh, uh, um, make changes in the way people live together. Um, but then we still have to talk about mobility, and I think that mobility is even a way bigger issue because we we can we can build houses quite quite okay, we can build new neighborhoods quite okay, but mobility is even more complex, and we need a mobility strategy for Amsterdam, for the, the larger Amsterdam. So my point of view would be that um, um, we are starting with, a, with an energy roadmap. Uh, if, if you, carbon free 2050 is something also I, in, my, in my regular work, I, I work with so, how to make social housing carbon free in 2050. We are now, every city is talking about a roadmap to carbon freeness. We need a roadmap to um, keeping uh, uh, the mobility in Amsterdam okay, because we still have black spots. We have a, a lot of places where it doesn't go right. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen when uh, uh, the North Side Line is, mm. is going to start in next summer, I think. They hope. <laughs> so so the, 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 I could give you the answer, oh, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to arrange it. No, we'll make, we'll make mistakes, we'll fail, but we'll have success. and. I think that the thing is that we'll have to make sure that there's space for being different and there's space for uh, also um, for changing things after you fuck them up. Yeah. Is there someone yeah. who says, I a really need to ask this last yeah. question? Yeah. Mm. Pressure is on. Oh. Hi, my name is Victoria George. Um, so you shared a few many lessons um, learned from positive, successful implementation of your ideas. Were there any interesting failures? What's your most interesting failure? That's a good question. It's always, um, it, uh, if I hesitate about answering, it sounds as if I didn't fail on anything, uh, or I didn't think that I failed on anything. Uh, what's the, oh God, Bennett. Uh, I suppose my, my most interesting experience on getting elected was learning to was learning about patience. So, um, and that was uh, I was attacked to begin with because I was the first directly elected mayor, the first single person with that much power in Bristol, although it was soft power. And I was assuming power, because that's all power is, is what you assume. Um, I was attacked by one or two people who would almost stalk me around the city uh, and whenever there was a public event and they would come right up to me and speak into my face. And, and um, so my personal failure was telling one of those to fuck off when um, he was filming me on his phone, which then went... <laughs> everywhere so I think my biggest failure was a personal one early on of learning about being a very high-profile politician and that you should love everybody Wow <laughs> that's a good last response maybe to the to the last last um, we are going into the from January onwards we're organizing debates here um, I think you already said yes to one in January. Um, um, what is the, the thing that you heard tonight that you think we should take along on this route toward March? First, Rutger, then Nadja. And maybe you can say something as a famous um, last word um, for tonight. I think that, I think that, that in, in a way, um, the, 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 the attitude of rebellion and this... this, this, this um, sense of urgency of change is something that I'll take with me to March and it's something that that's it's not only visible in, in uh, has been visible in Bristol but I see this, this, this urge of change also in all kinds of cities for example if you look at Barcelona uh, 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 or in Madrid where there, uh, and in, in Berlin and I know there's a, there's a um, 
there's this coalition of cities which call themselves fearless cities. <coughs> and our cities, what, from my perspective, are doing what Bristol has done, what George has done, is breaking rules and making change. Uh, and and that, that feels <laughs> something like, that, that's, I think, uh, what should be done in Amsterdam. And I think that Amsterdam could benefit from cooperating yeah. with these other larger cities, because I think that we have the same challenges and uh, uh, the same yeah. issues. Um, so that's yeah. the Nadia? basic thing. Um, to be creative uh, in finding solutions. Um, uh, we just talked about um, uh, certain areas having a certain character uh, to work with what you have. It's also something that George said. Um, there's no one size fits all. So be creative, on, sometimes on a hyper-local scale, to find solutions that actually are, um, that benefit the people that need it and that are long-term. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and long-term solutions. Instead of um, trying to create quick fixes, really look on how to create solutions that, are, that work on the long-term. Yeah. George, do you have any last remarks? Well, I think we ought to reflect on the fact that the majority of our cities are occupied by the minority of the people, um, whether they be the rich who take up the bigger spaces or the car drivers who take up all the spaces. <laughs> and I think we need to reflect on this question that was an Amsterdam question of who owns the city and try and give the city back to people because as Shakespeare said, it's uh, what is, or ask the question, in Coriolanus, what is the city but the people? So give the city back to the people. And when you think about that question, we have stolen a huge amount of our cities from the people and from the kids who are kept inside because of it. And, and my last thought is thank you so much for all speaking English. I'm so ashamed that all of you here are having to speak English and that I can't speak Dutch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George Ferguson. Um, I must say it was a pleasure to, to, well, to breathe some air with you into the Amsterdam discussion and look towards other examples because I think sometimes we look too much inwards well, there's so much interesting things to happen. I'd also like to thank my other panelists, Rutger Grootwassink and Nadja Awaki. Give them a warm welcome. Of a warm applause. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank you for being here. We have one um, final event uh, next week, Friday. Um, if you want your Christmas, um, we'll have a good Christmas borrow afterwards. Uh, so uh, be there and it's going to be nice. In January, we're going to have uh, debates with all the political leaders. So watch our site. Um, I think Rutger is going to be there January 15th. So you can mark that already in your agenda. Um, uh, have a good trip home. I think it's dry now, but uh, the, bar, the bar is also very warm. So please stay there for a drink and a talk with George. Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you.